So one team nominated 34 for discussion. 34 says that if alpha and beta are two real numbers and alpha is less than beta, uh, and we also know that x is between alpha and beta and y is also between alpha and beta, we're supposed to prove that the absolute value of x minus y is less than beta minus alpha, and then also write a couple of sentences that talk about why that result is not surprising in view of uh, sort of the geometry, which is kind of a funny word to use, uh, of the real line in the interval alpha beta. Uh, so what was your, where do you feel like you're getting stuck on 34? What did you? Ah, well, so I didn't, you, you did prove it in part A, I guess, is, is the point. So let me get that sentence that you just said that was your interpretation. So if x and y are in the interval, alpha, beta, uh, how did you finish that sentence? Then the distance between x and y must be less than the distance between alpha and beta. Right. And so one of the weird things about the statement of this problem is they use the word geometric, which makes us think of like shapes and areas and volumes. And really, it's just asking us to interpret this result in terms of distance, which your sentence does. Um, uh, I was emailing with somebody who had a good diagram for this. Um, so what might a diagram look like that would testify to the truth of this statement? Yeah, well, you'd have to use a number line. Um, and we're given that alpha is less than beta, so we know for sure that alpha and beta are situated like this on the real line. Put an R out here. Um, OK, and then x and y, we don't know how x and y compare one to another. right? We just know that x and y are each inside of the interval, the open interval, from alpha to beta. So they might be arranged in this way if x is less than y. They might be arranged this way if x is greater than y. x and y could actually be the same number. We don't know that. Um, but the point of the proof that you did at the top of the page is that whatever distance exists between x and y, it can't be any larger than the diameter of the entire interval. In other words, the distance from alpha to beta. Right? So the blue distance here has to be less than the red distance. That's the geometric interpretation they're looking at. Um, because we know that alpha is less than beta, we know that beta minus alpha, in particular, is a positive number. And because it's a positive number, beta minus alpha and the absolute value of beta minus alpha are identical. Right? So that's why we get away with interpreting this beta minus alpha on the right side of the inequality as the distance between alpha and beta or another way to say it, the diameter of the interval. In 35, we have two different sets. We have a set E, which we don't really know anything about. We know it's a set of real numbers. And then we have a set A, which consists of the absolute values of all the elements of E. Right? So these two sets have a relationship between them. Um, and the point of this problem is to show that the relationship, is, the relationship status is complicated. Right? Um, as far as the, the, the suprema and the infima of these two sets, they could relate in a variety of different ways uh, that you explore in, in, these, in these cases. So I'm not really looking for a proof in these examples, but rather looking for some concrete examples that can illustrate how these different things can happen. Right? Uh, and then kind of at the end, they ask you to make a, just a conjecture about when each of these things happens. Um, but we can be really concrete in the beginning. Um, does somebody have an example of a set E that they use to show that there is a case in which the suprema of E and A are actually equal. What's an example for part A? Okay. So E is just a, a just a list zero one two three four five, yeah. like this. Okay. So there's a set of real numbers. The supremum of E is. Five. One of the things we didn't prove, but we could prove, is that the supremum of E is also equal to the max of E for this set. How, how do we know that, by the way? It's right. So whenever a set has a maximal element, that maximal element is also the supremum of the set 
That is something I think we proved uh, a couple of weeks ago, right? When the max exists, it's also the supremum. Okay, so the max, uh, the, sup the sup of E is five. Um, the great thing about working with a concrete set like this is now we can also say concretely what the set A is. I'm just going to write it in all of its glory first, right? It consists of the absolute values of all the elements from E. But when I take the absolute values of all these elements, what happens? They're the same as the original. So in this example, the sets E and A are actually equal as sets. And so in such an example, it's not surprising that the supremum of A and the supremum of E are going to be the same, because in fact, those two sets are we're equal on the nose. So let's modify this example ever so slightly. Let me take the 0 out of E and replace it with negative 6, as Matt's suggesting. Now, what's the supremum of E? It's still 5, right? That's, that's the maximal element. Um, but now, what's going to change in the set A? Right, I'm going to have a positive 6 here. So what's the supremum of A going to be? So now we've got an issue, right? So here's a case where the suprema of these two sets might not be the same. So my, my hope for you in this problem is that you sort of play around with examples. And you can play around with very simple examples like you know, rosters of just five or six elements, even two or three elements you could probably get some mileage out of. Right? Play with some really small examples to see how these different things might happen uh, in the comparisons of supremum and infimum. And then try and, and, and make a conjecture. When I look at this, when I, when I sort of score it, I'm not going to be looking for a perfect sort of proof uh, at the end, but just sort of what lesson do you learn from these various examples uh, that you play with in parts A through D? So question 39, um, what, what did the group that nominated 39 want to hear more about? Is that? I just wasn't sure like how. So the burden of proof here is a proof, right? What we have to show is that the function d of x, y that's defined, d of x, y equals absolute value of x minus y. So we have the definition of a function. It's a function of two variables, if you like, right? So here's a function. And we have to show that that function satisfies all four of the properties that make it a distance function, or, or the word that we use in, in analysis as, as a metric. Right? This is the, the chance for us to prove that the absolute value is actually capable of measuring distance between things in a coherent fashion. Because right? these are the four properties that a function of two variables has to have, a function that can compare the distance between two points has to have in order to make it coherent. So for example, we know from sort of geometry that any time we measure the distance between two things, that distance is always a non-negative number. Right? We never speak of a negative distance. And so the first one of these properties is we need to show that d of x, y, this function defined in such a way, right, never gives us a negative answer. Well, how do we know that that's true? It's an absolute value. Right. So we can, s you could do a proof by contradiction. It depends. So the other question, and this is a question no matter what kind of proof you're writing, the other question is what material do we have to work with, right? What do we know that we can actually use and deploy in this proof? Um, we happen to know, since d of x, y is equal to the absolute value of x minus y, we happen to know properties of absolute value. In particular, what do we know about the absolute value of any quantity? I'm going to say for all z, the absolute value of z is either, um, minus four. so right. The definition is it's either equal to itself or it's equal to its opposite, right? Um, depending on whether z is positive or negative, that's the definition of absolute value. But we also know some properties of absolute value that might be relevant, right? What do we know about absolute values that's going to help us here? It can never be negative. We can kind of see from the definition of absolute value. We could prove that by breaking it into cases, but I don't think we want to prove that here. I just want to use this property of absolute value. So the, I guess maybe the, the, the theme here is I'm looking for you to connect the properties of absolute value that we know to the properties that we want to exist for a distance function, a metric, okay, the axioms, the four axioms that are here. So in this example, because absolute value of anything, no matter what, is always non-negative, that means that, in particular, the absolute value of x minus y, which is how we define this function, will always be non-negative. 
by properties of absolute value. So if you find yourself doing a lot of computations in this proof, you're probably working too hard. One of the, the reasons for having theorems and axioms and definitions in prior knowledge is that um, they help us to work smarter, work more efficiently. Um, so we don't have to go reprove that the absolute value of a quantity is non-negative always um, if we can use the axiom of absolute value that tells us that that's so. Okay. And so you should see in these four properties of a metric, um, each of those should be mirrored in a corresponding property of the absolute value, which we can take for granted. We don't have to reprove. So you just have to make the connection in this proof. So what we're doing in 38 is we're taking a set of real numbers, uh, the alternating unit fractions, so sort of half of them are positive, half of them are negative, and we want to show that for any epsilon greater than zero that we choose, no matter how small, there exists an element of this set such that the absolute value of x is less than epsilon. So you might recognize this statement. Now that we've talked about convergence, this sounds an awful lot like a statement about convergence of a sequence. Um, can we, by the way, reframe this? Now that we know what the definition of convergent sequence is, this is not something you'll do on the homework, but I just want to make this connection. Um, how can we reframe this statement as a statement about the sequence? The sequence, um, which would be 1 half minus 1 third, 1 fourth, and so on. What is this statement really saying about that sequence? sounds an awful lot like the claim that the sequence converges to zero. The only problem with it is that it's lacking, um, it's lacking that for all n greater than n idea in the definition of convergence, right? In the definition of convergence, so here's our sequence uh, in the green dots. Um, and so the claim is, the claim we're trying to establish is that no matter how small I choose my epsilon, I can find an element of my sequence which is within that epsilon bandwidth of zero. Right? And so if I choose epsilon to be, for example, 0 0.09, right? so this is my epsilon, um, then can I find an element of my set which is within that bandwidth? Yeah, OK, here's one. Right? So it exists. Done. Now, the problem with this as a definition of convergence um, is that what if our sequence, let me get back out for a second. What if my sequence also included one more point? Let me just tack on one more point into our sequence here. Uh, let's just say that there's one more point in our sequence. What if So now what if this were my sequence? So in our definition, we only said we can find a point, which is within epsilon, for any epsilon, no matter how small, of 0. And that's true for this sequence. But it's not true for this sequence that there exists a capital N such that for all n greater than or equal to n, the sequence, all of the terms past that point are within the epsilon bandwidth of 0. right? Um, because in particular, if this is my epsilon, for example, um, as soon as I pass n equals 5, there exists an n greater than capital N such that that term of the sequence is outside of my epsilon band. So that's no good. So even though this sequence would still satisfy the definition that we're working with in homework number 4, it wouldn't satisfy the definition of convergence uh, that we would be working with in homework packet number 5. So what we might say. This is a lesson in sort of logical mathematical vocabulary for a second. What I would say is that the statement that a sequence converges to 0 is actually a stronger statement than the statement that we can find an element such that the absolute value of x is less than epsilon for any epsilon, no matter how small. So in other words, 
any sequence which satisfies the statement on the left will also satisfy the statement on the right. If my sequence does converge to 0, then for sure we can find an element with an epsilon of 0, no matter how small we choose epsilon. We can definitely find an element. But it's not always true that just being able to find an element with an epsilon of 0 guarantees that the sequence converges, because we could have an example like this one. Right? Um, so just vocabulary-wise, we say that um, the definition of convergence is a stronger definition or equivalently, the one that we're working with here is a weaker definition. Um, so let's jump ahead to, to part C of this. So in part A, whoops, didn't mean to get rid of that. Uh, in part A, uh, we're just working with the, the form of these uh, elements in the set and showing that uh, rearranging this inequality, absolute value of, uh, of the elements plus or minus 1 over n is less than epsilon, Rearrange it, and you end up with a statement that looks like n is greater than 1 over epsilon, I believe. Right? That, is that where you end up? Um, and then the next question in part b asks, how do we know that a natural number exists which satisfies this inequality, regardless of what epsilon we choose? Archimedes. Yeah, that's the Archimedes principle. Um, by Archimedes. I'll let you fill in those details. Um, but yeah, that's the, that's the engine of this, right? The Archimedes axiom tells us that no matter what real number I choose, no matter how large, if epsilon is very small, 1 over epsilon is going to be very large. No matter how large 1 over epsilon is, I can find some natural number which is bigger than it. That's the content of the, the Archimedes axiom. Um, OK, so that's, those are the two pieces that you get from parts A and B. So now let's take a look and see. I think the biggest thing to get comfortable with in goal number two of our course, and goal number two is to understand how sequences can tell us something about the nature of real numbers, sequences and convergence of sequences, um, is how to structure a proof that a sequence converges. And again, this is not quite a proof that this sequence converges, because it's the slightly weaker statement, right, that we can find an element that's within epsilon of, of zero. Um, but Nevertheless, um, we can, so let's take a look at how this, this structure goes. We're supposed to prove, and I'm going to write the statement again here at the top. We're supposed to prove that for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists an element x in my set such that the absolute value of x is less than epsilon. We might say, the elements of x, there exist elements of the set arbitrarily close to 0, is another way to say that. So in order to prove this, we first look and say this is a universal statement, right? meaning that our proof has to work for all epsilons greater than 0. That means that me, as the proof writer, I don't get to choose what epsilon is. I have to let the reader, or the invisible hand of mathematics, choose what value epsilon has. right? Um, and so that kind of ties my hands a little bit. And it forces me to start out my proof by coming to grips with that fact. This is probably, those people who have taken real analysis before and have had to write a lot of proofs, um, the sentence, let epsilon greater than zero be arbitrarily chosen, is emblazoned upon their brain because so many proofs start this way. And a lot of proofs start this way because so many claims in analysis begin with this universal quantifier. For all epsilon greater than zero, no matter how small, dot, 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 dot. Anytime we go to prove a statement like that, we have to start by accepting the fact that someone else is choosing our epsilon for us. And so we'll just take their epsilon and we'll put it on the table and declare, I don't know what value this epsilon has. It's arbitrary. But my proof shouldn't care. Right? My proof needs to work no matter what value that epsilon has. So feel free to copy-paste that sentence to the beginning of any proof that begins with for all epsilon greater than zero. And every proof of convergence of a sequence will begin with that quantifier. Right? So we say, let's let epsilon greater than 0 be arbitrarily chosen, not by us, but by you know, the forces of nature. So then we say, how do we know that there exists an n which satisfies the inequality that we found in A? Well, we decided in part B that that was the Archimedes axiom. And I'll let you fill in the filler words here. Because of the Archimedes principle, we know there exists an n which satisfies the inequality, and the inequality from a is n is greater than 1 over epsilon. Right. 
And so now we've brought an n onto the table. But what we're supposed to do in our proof is we're supposed to show that there exists an element of u, an element of the set u. And one of the best ways to show that an element exists is to actually construct it, to say, here is my element that belongs to u. Now I'm going to show you that that element also satisfies this inequality that we're trying to establish. And so at this point, we say in the proof, let's define x to be either plus or minus, depending on whether n is even or odd, right? Um, 1 over n, where this n is this n. Right? So for this value of n, we can construct an element of the set, which is either 1 over n or minus 1 over n. Right? Then all we have to do is show that that element, oh, there's another, uh, that's another reason why I should try to copy paste less. Yeah, this inequality that we had here should have been the same inequality from part A uh, that we were trying to show. So yeah, I got to take the rap for some of the confusion on part C here. Maybe a lot of the confusion on part C. Because um, what we're trying to show, remember, is that the absolute value of x is less than epsilon. So what we should be proving down here at the bottom is that the absolute value of x is less than epsilon. And what we're doing in this part is we're just kind of rewriting the inequality that we solved in part A. We're just we're sort of rewriting those steps, um, rewriting them backwards, actually, in a way. Um, so if I have the absolute value of, of x, then because x is defined to be either 1 over n or minus 1 over n, what is this going to be equal to? What's the absolute value of plus or minus 1 over n going to look like? Yeah, it's just going to be 1 over n. Because if it's positive 1 over n, then it's going to remain positive 1 over n. And if it's negative 1 over n, that negative sign is going to go away because n is positive because it's a natural number. Right? So that absolute value is always going to give us 1 over n since n is greater than 0 by construction. But then what do we know about n? We know that n is greater than 1 over epsilon. So if n is greater than the reciprocal of epsilon, what can we say about the reciprocal of 1 over n? What would happen in, in yeah, exactly. In this inequality, if I take the reciprocal on both sides, then on the left-hand side, I'm going to get 1 over n. On the right-hand side, I'm going to get 1 over 1 over epsilon. And then what happens to the sense of an inequality when we take reciprocals on both sides? It reverses, right? Because reciprocal is a decreasing operation. Because essentially, we're working in the denominator of a fraction, which is bizarro world, right? Having a larger denominator gives us a smaller fraction, and vice versa. Um, so that means that because we know since one, sorry, since n is greater than 1 over epsilon, 1 over n is actually less than 1 over 1 over epsilon. But 1 over 1 over epsilon is nothing more than epsilon. So I'm going to change that little thing to an equal sign there. Um, and that completes the proof. Right? So when you read this last argument from beginning to end, we have shown that the absolute value of x is less than epsilon. So the form of our proof matches the logical form of the statement that we're trying to prove. Our proof begins with an arbitrarily chosen epsilon greater than 0 because that's how our epsilon is quantified, at the very beginning of the statement we're trying to prove. So we have to accept that we have no control over epsilon. It's arbitrarily chosen for us. And luckily, it doesn't matter because of Archimedes. No matter how large 1 over epsilon might be, there's still a natural number which is bigger than 1 over epsilon. Archimedes gives us that. And so Archimedes is kind of the reason that it doesn't matter in this proof what the value of epsilon is. It works for all epsilons because of Archimedes. And for this value of n, we can show that if we take either 1 over n or minus 1 over n, whichever one is appropriate to uh, construct the corresponding element of the set u, that the absolute value of that element is less than epsilon because the absolute value of that element is just 1 over n, which according to this inequality is less than epsilon.